think it is. Um, who else do you think might be receptive to yeah. a story like this? Yeah. People who regret, who like she, regret the loss of traditional Jewish culture, who are worried about the Jews disappearing. She she says she sits down to write in 1898. That is one year after the Zionist first Zionist Congress. It's one year after the founding of the Bund. Yiddish culture, Hebrew literature have started to take off. There is a resurgence precisely among her children and her grandchildren's generation of people who were saying, I, I got robbed. I got robbed of my culture here. For what? There is rampant anti-Semitism. There were pogroms. For what? Did we give all of this up? And I'm ignorant because of the sins of my parents for not teaching me this culture. Remember the, the recipes? Here's how you play dreidel, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Here's what goes on in a Seder. Here's what we do on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Those are the grandchildren, in my opinion. She doesn't mention one biological grandchild, and she had quite a few. Mm -hmm. But these, and I don't think her children or her grandchildren were particularly interested in anything. One child who was a writer was, as a writer, interested. But none of them are interested in the content of this or what she's trying to do with it. They're not her audience. But I think that the young, the youth of the cultural upsurge of the turn, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, the, the cultural Zionists and the other cultural Jews who are trying to find a way back, are very interested in this. And I think that A, that's who the actual audience is, and that's also her intended audience. And when she writes memoirs of a grandmother, it's a metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. So who published her? Who published her? A Jewish publishing house in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And that goes to, you know, a room of one's own. She had one. She had people who read this and said, thank you, lady. Mm -hmm. Let's publish this. And if you look at who the publishing house was and who published with that publishing house, it's people who are trying to lead a cultural resurgence mm -hmm. in Germany and in Russia including some Zionists, but not only Zionists. Well, since she was alive when she published this, um, like, did she know if, this, if the first volume did well? And no, yeah, she did yeah. yeah, she writes when she, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's this ruse. She says, I'm yeah. so delighted that I wrote volume two. Yeah, she yeah. had written it before. No, she, she knew. There's a, she, she left an archive. This is a woman of tremendous self-consciousness, an archive. She, like this, a folder of reviews. <laughs> and then, what was the time frame between uh, the first and the second volume? Did she immediately pick up on volume two? Yeah, I mean, the first was published in 1908, and the second in 19 published, mm -hmm. which means it was written already. Is there um, any history of writings of hers before that? Other than, other than diaries? No, she did. She published a little bit in okay. a Russian paper okay. uh -huh. and in a and in a, a Jewish, a Russian Jewish paper in the Russian language, and in a German as well. She she did. She also corresponded with Herzl. Oh, uh -huh. and this woman's got so it isn't like she just turned sixty five and sat yeah. down and batted at the first. No, but I mean she's been she's a writer. I mean she's been she's keeping a, a diary. She's been you know she's a writer. And she did write some stuff. And the stuff that she wrote in Russian is a prototype of what came out in Germany as the Muslims. Very close prototype. Not all of this resonates in my family's tales, or, or at least what I experienced of them. They were all born in Russia. And I lived in the Odessa area. Uh, my mother's father was trained as a pharmacist and um, uh -huh. One of the things Jews were allowed uh, to do, guess, is all the way down here. So oh, all the way down. Yeah, all the way down here. And may, not pertain, near her. Near her. may not pertain particularly, but my grandmother never revolted. He took off, well, very, some of a very wealthy family, to France and party around in Italy and whatever young men did. She was forced to run the store, the pharmacy. My grandmother, that is, my mother's mother. 
and um, eventually, I guess, he found work in the United States, sent for the family, and he escaped, you know, to come to the United States, but that would have been more like a hundred years ago. And um, that's when she published, published hundred years ago. Hundred years ago. But I never sensed that that dissatisfaction, that um, that uh, expression of inequality, of you know, lack of equality in the relationship. My grandmother just fell in with it. <laughs> Well, also, I mean, the ability to do this, as I, as I said, that is to dispense with the productive labor of the woman, is a function of a significant level of wealth. So the vast majority of Jews couldn't do it. Not an option. I was surprised to hear you say that Jews had the highest <laughs> divorce rate. I Rampant. Mean, why was that? And I guess I was always under the false impression that that was something that was highly discouraged in our Jewish culture. Not only that, the Shachanim loved it. They would go to couples and say, hey, why don't you get divorced? This is more... You, you understand? Sh 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 the, mar na the matchmaking. More to the Eastern the business. The business. More clients. Hmm? Is that more unique to Eastern European culture, or...? No, it wasn't enlightenment because it was a lot. It was going throughout all the classes of Jewish society, including well, you know, people who were Many of the marriages were arranged and uh, and then turned out to be disastrous. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was arranged marriage. Arranged marriage is also a function of wealth. But I know that in my own family, my great grandmother, I mean, this was like a mystery of my childhood, was divorced. But she had been married to a man who was much older. Oh. And she complained bitterly to her parents, and at some point they said, okay, okay. come back and we'll try again. So I think that's part, it, I mean, we have to take out that romantic notion of Absolutely. what marriages were. Yeah. And if, you, if the arrangement was bad enough, somebody was going to... Arranged know. marriages, poverty, um, this was a, a time of increasing. Poverty was getting worse, more widespread and more extreme. Poverty. It, there's a very, very extensive study by a historian of this whole thing um, about the phenomenon and documenting it, and uh, you know what what is the background for it. But poverty is a lot of it. And were gets readily given? I mean, to get a get, if if the if the parties are willing, and particularly he, because he's the one who has to grant it, it takes a few hours. Hmm. You know, something if they're married for 10 years and there's no kids, you know, that's divorce. Um, no, there's a tremendous amount of divorce. So when the going gets tough, the tough, the slack, and everybody in between go. Right. Yeah. There's so many variations on these stories. My grandparents had an arranged marriage and were wealthy, and my grandfather sold his soda water factory and gave my grandmother half of the money and the three younger children. And he went to Israel, to Palestine, with the three older children. And he was the founder of Merhavia, which is the Did they divorce or they just, no, no, they no. just separated? He said, I'll send for you. But there was a small problem. It was called World War One and the yeah. Russian Revolution. <laughs> So there were many variations on these stories. Yeah, one of the variations, although it may have been already a little bit later, was that uh, it wasn't divorce, it was abandonment. Yes, by, that's right. By Jewish men who came to America right. and uh, pretended that they were single and married here in right. America. And nobody ever knew that they had been married before. Mm -hmm. They were still married. Though. I mean, it got a lot easier. <laughs> once, once there were railroads and steamships, you can just leave. Yeah. Do you know anything about the genre of um, memoirs of women following her work? We have come across a few, um, and I just wondered um, how, how, widespread, how widespread that became. 